By late 997, Bulgarian Emperor Roman, the last ruler of the Krum dynasty, died in Byzantine captivity. He spent his final years governing a vast estate that was generously provided to him by his captor, Basil II. Since his capture, Samuel became de facto ruler, successfully waging war against the Byzantine Empire. But after suffering a crippling defeat in the Battle of Sperkaios at the hands of Basil II's star general, Nikiforos Oranus, Samuel was forced to seek terms. But the year 997 would be a fleeting moment of peace on the western Byzantine frontier, as the two Balkan empires geared up to continue the war. Neither would rest until one of them was gone for good. With the death of Emperor Roman, a conclusion to the long Byzantine-Bulgarian war finally seemed to be on the horizon. Byzantine Emperor Basil II now hoped he would have an easier job in carving up Bulgarian lands. However, not long after Roman's passing, Samuel adopted the title of Tsar. This was enough to enrage Basil, who dispatched Oranus with orders to ruthlessly plunder the Bulgarian countryside. Aware of his diminished strength, Samuel could only ignore the Byzantine incursion. Luckily for the Bulgarian monarch, trouble in the east would once again force Basil II to divert his attention from the west. In the summer of 998, the Fatimids crushed a Roman army close to Apamea, executing the Byzantine commander of the east, Damien de la Senos, and seriously endangering the empire's eastern frontier. By the autumn of 999, Basil crossed the Taurus Mountains with General Oranus in tow. The emperor made sure to punish the Fatimid-controlled Archia and Homus, storming and ruthlessly sacking both cities. The latter's population was supposedly burned alive by Basil's Varangians while trying to take refuge in a church. But the Roman advance along the Mediterranean coast was once again halted at the city of Tripoli, where Basil's army suffered heavy losses in a sally of the local garrison. Despite the minor setback, the speed and effectiveness of Basil's campaign had convinced the advisors of the young puppet caliph Al-Hakim to seek peace. Around 1000 AD, a truce would finally be negotiated, ultimately leading to 16 years of uninterrupted peace between Byzantium and the Fatimids. The emperor could finally head home. However, his job in the east was not over yet. Important news reached Basil en route while he was wintering in the plains of Tarsus. David III of the Georgian kingdom of Tau had passed away during the early months of 1000 AD. Ten years ago, Basil had forced the aging king to adopt him as his son and heir, disrupting David's old agreement with his other adopted son, Bagrat III of Abkhazia. Quickly overcoming the grief from the passing of his adoptive father, Basil marched to claim his hefty inheritance. Not long after, the kingdom of Tau was officially absorbed by the Byzantine Empire. Basil then toured his new province, handing out court titles to local Georgian rulers to ensure their loyalty. In addition, the emperor made sure to show off his army, just in case any of the nobles had any ideas. This seemed to work for the time, and Basil decided to head for Constantinople around mid-1000 AD, leaving the capable Oranus as his new duke in the east. Oranus quickly proved himself a competent governor against King Gurgen of Iberia. Dissatisfied with the minor court title he was given by Basil, Gurgen invaded the Byzantine Empire. However, his attempts were quickly thwarted by Oranus, and the Georgians withdrew. Having returned to Constantinople in late 1000 AD, Basil wasted no time in preparing for the resumption of conflict with Bulgaria. But much had changed in the Balkans during the Emperor's absence. 
Samuel had successfully invaded Serbia, capturing the ruler of the leading principality of Dukja, Ivan Vladimir, before pillaging most of the Dalmatian coast. This aggression towards Byzantine allies could not go unpunished, and in 1001, Basil prepared for a large-scale invasion. He tasked a certain Nikiforos Zivias with crossing the Balkan mountains and striking into Bulgaria's old heartland to the north. In the meantime, Basil left a small garrison in Philippopolis and marched towards Sredets. Still haunted by memories of the disastrous 989 campaign, the emperor only plundered the city's environs without laying a siege. To the east, Xiphias made good progress, capturing the old Bulgarian capitals of Pliska and Preslav, before pressing north towards Durostorum. Devastated by the decades of war, much of northern Bulgaria was easy prey at this time. Even the almost impregnable stronghold of Durostorum fell into Byzantine hands without much resistance. Zephyas then plundered his way through Dobruja, leaving garrisons as he went. By the end of the year, the Byzantines had reclaimed their ancient province of Moesia. In the wake of this success, Basil and Zephyas spent the winter in Constantinople, making plans for the upcoming campaign in 1002. Once the snow melted, they headed back for the frontier, this time planning to strike at the political heart of the country, Macedonia. Basil's first stop was the fortress of Veria, a stronghold that Samuel reconquered around 996. Again, Basil approached the invasion with tactical and diplomatic wit. He promised hefty rewards and titles to any Bulgarian noble who submitted to Constantinople. The governor of Veria, a man named Dobromir, who was also married to Samuel's niece, did not need much convincing. The town was taken without a siege, and its ruler was rewarded with the title of Pro-Consul. It didn't take long for word of Basil's leniency to spread, and many nobles from Thessaly, Macedonia, and Bulgaria proper to surrender to the Byzantine Emperor most notably Demeter, the ruler of the fort of Calindria. Yet not everyone was tempted by Basil's promises. Nikolitsa, the governor of Servia, resisted the Byzantines for months. Despite that, the fortress of Servia and its headstrong governor were eventually captured by the Romans. Choosing mercy over cruelty, Basil gave Nikolitsa the title of patrician, sending the man to a comfortable retirement in Constantinople. But, unfortunately for the Emperor, the relentless Bulgarian would escape from the capital and try to retake Servia, only to be captured again. This time the Emperor's patience had run out, and Nikolitsa was imprisoned for life. Following this fiasco, the Emperor headed for the fortress of Vaden. Located on a high ridge, this stronghold fell after an intense siege that lasted many months. With these conquests, Basil secured control over southern Macedonia. However, there was still work to be done in the area. The Emperor spent the rest of 1002 rebuilding the devastated fortresses of Thessaly, before finally returning to winter in Constantinople. Not wasting any time, Basil was already preparing to lay another siege. This time his aim was Vidin, Bulgaria's most important northern city, an impregnable fortress without which control over the Danube River was impossible. By late spring, Basil was already encamped close to Vidin's walls, marking the start of what would become the longest siege of the war. For Samuel, the prospect of his key northern city falling was unnerving. Depleted of troops, the Tsar had stayed passive while Basil kept reducing his strongholds in Macedonia. But now, he had to act. After mustering his diminished army, Samuel marched through Thrace and, by August, reached Adrianople. 
The Tsar attempted to storm the city while its garrison was distracted by a festival held on the 15th. However, the town's sturdy fortifications halted all of Samuel's attempts. Tired of failing to conquer the city, the Bulgarian monarch thoroughly plundered the local countryside, hoping that this would finally trigger a reaction and force Basil to lift the siege and head back for Adrianople. Basil did not take the bait. After an eight-month-long blockade, a local Bulgarian bishop led the Byzantine forces inside Vidin. The city had fallen to Basil, and with it, the entirety of northern Bulgaria. The emperor decided to spend the winter in the town, busying himself with administrative matters. In the meantime, a likely angered Samuel was sluggishly retreating towards Skopje. Word of this reached Basil, and the emperor moved to intercept the Bulgarians. In early spring, the emperor led his men southwards through Nesus before reaching the Varda River, located just south of Skopje. Basil had once again outmaneuvered Samuel, who had not yet entered the city. Encamped on the southern bank of the Varda, just to the east of Skopje, the Tsar's men were totally unprepared for what was coming. Though highly unlikely, the few sources we have on the battle mention that the Bulgarian Tsar repeated the same mistake he made at Sperkios, believing the river to be unfordable and failing to keep an eye on Basil. Much like his general Oranos, the emperor managed to cross the river at night and surprise Samuel. Given the Tsar's military experience and the considerable depth of the Varda River, this likely isn't what exactly happened. Nevertheless, Basil found a way to catch Samuel and his ragtag army by surprise. The two forces clashed, Basil's men severely outnumbering the Bulgarians. Caught off guard, Samuel exposing himself to a Roman attack on an open field. With that, Basil's victory was guaranteed before the clash had even started. Despite the fierce resistance of the Bulgarians, their casualties quickly mounted, and Samuel was forced to call a retreat. Basil seems to have not engaged in a pursuit, instead choosing to concentrate his efforts on the city of Skopje. Before a proper siege could even begin, however, the city opened its gates to the Romans. Samuel's defeat at the Battle of Skopje was a minor defeat. Despite this, Basil had ticked off another former Bulgarian capital from his list. Confident after his victory, the emperor headed for Pernik, a Bulgarian fortress located about 50 kilometers southwest of Sredets. Pernik's governor, Krakra, was not tempted by Basil's promises of wealth and titles. After months of intensive siege and many losses caused by Krakra's constant sallying from the fort, the emperor was forced to retreat to Constantinople. Meanwhile, the absence of Basil allowed Samuel to recapture Skopje soon after. But by 1004, Basil had exhausted Bulgaria and the decisive battle for the survival of the Tsardom was about to begin. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as one dollar, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.